Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Good to see you all here this morning. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the director of Fly Ranch, and I work for Burning Man Project. And today we have an exciting list of folks to talk to you um, about carbon dioxide removal. So I'm going to mention a few things. Um, first, just want to say thanks to all of our speakers for joining today and to everyone who's helping put this call on. There's a lot of folks who've put effort in here today and I'm really grateful for them. This is a call that is built on a series of ecosystem activation calls that Burners Without Borders and other groups have put together at Burning Man before. So today's call is focused on one of our three goals from Burning Man's 2030 Sustainability Roadmap to be carbon negative. We also have had ones on regenerative. We'll have another one on handling waste ecologically. So we have a series of these that we'll be putting together. So you can check those out. We have more materials that you can find on our websites, which I hope Stephen will post here. Um, second, I um, just want to note that I um, uh, live on Ramatush Learning Land in San Francisco. That's where Burning Man's office is as well. And then we're on Numu, Northern Paiute Land uh, in the desert where we host Black Rock City and where Fly Ranch is. And um, I don't say that because I think it makes it okay. I say that as a reminder to myself that we're on occupied land um, and part of the relationship that we have to land is uh, you know, tied to this way that land has come into being something that we manage or something that we own. And part of what we've been trying to think about for our approach to this goal is how can we make sure that we're part of a just transition and um, being stewards and thinking carefully about our relationship with land. If you'd like to learn more about where you are, there's a great app called Native Land that I'll chat in right here where you can look up what land you are on. Finally, um, I'll put two resources in here. One is a quick overview of carbon capture, and the other one is a nature paper. Um, that's a really good overview of carbon dioxide removal. And what we're doing here today is kind of an intermediate call. So if you don't have familiarity with carbon dioxide removal before or burning down sustainability goals, you might have a little reading you want to do. So we've tried to put a lot of links into the um, event itself. So with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off and give Skirpus, the Fly Ranch land steward, uh, who is also an expert in carbon and carbon cycles and um, let her go ahead and kick it off and give a little bit of scientific background. Skirpus. Hi, greetings everybody from the lovely Lo de Marcos, Mexico. This is a very vibrant community, so there's a lot of, a lot of noise around me, but it just adds to, adds to the, the, the joy of being here. Um, so like Matt said, I'm a Fly Ranch Fellow, um, and I um, also, for my day job, study carbon dynamics in coastal wetlands. So I look at sources and sinks in mangroves in um, uh, coastal wetlands. And then I also take those data, put them into greenhouse gas inventories, both for the United States and other countries. And then also have been advising other countries and um, people in using uh, coastal wetlands and carbon projects as well. So uh, with that background, I'm very uh, happy to talk about the carbon cycle and um, the different pools and fluxes um, within this carbon cycle. So carbon is the fourth uh, most abundant element uh, within the planet. Um, it's the basic building block um, for all of our um, most everything, um, the chemical background uh, for most things in the, in the, in the uh, world. Um, it, the amount of carbon that we have is the same, but we're changing where it is and how it, what form it's in all the time. Um, there are five main pools of carbon uh, within uh, the Earth. Uh, the largest pool is within the interior of the Earth. So that's within the rocks, within the mantle, within the crust. And this is largely um, uh, stationary and there's not much flux from that. Um, the second largest pool that we have is within the oceans. And the majority of that is within um, the, the deep sea and in the ocean floors. And this is a very, uh, we call this a slow carbon pool that there's not a lot of flux within the deep ocean. But at the surface, 
that's where the greatest exchange of carbon occurs, uh, both with the photosynthesis that happens within plankton, and then also with just direct atmospheric exchange between um, the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, our next largest pool is within the biosphere itself. So within vegetation, uh, within animals and within uh, soils. And then next we have the atmosphere um, that's largely um, comprised of nitrogen. So carbon dioxide is only a tiny fraction about uh, just less than half of a percent. Um, and then we have our human impacts, um, what, what we do just with our own respiration and such. And then also uh, the amount of carbon that we're taking from our deep slow pools and putting them into the air. Um, so basically there's all these fluxes that happen and um, what we're taking from the deep uh, sea and the deep, like the, our fossil fuels and adding that to the atmosphere is changing our, um, our weather as we know. And it's also um, happening at a rate which natural processes can't, um, can't work with the up uptake in order to put it back into the ground. And so there's, we need to focus on reducing what we produce uh, protecting what we have, and then also um, some innovative technologies on trying to um, to to stop the slow of or to slow the stop of um, of carbon dioxide uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And with that, I'll hand it off to Matt. Thank you, Scripus. <laughs> um, we are lucky to have another scientist joining us from Burning Man Project staff. Marnie Benson, who has done a emissions inventory about Black Rock City that she will now present. Marnie, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation for us today. OK. Last year, Burning Man Project undertook an emissions inventory of Black Rock City with a core team that included me, Jesse Gibson, Ryan Mortina, and David Shearer. I presented some of those results in our sustainability year two update in July of this year, and I shared quite a lot about our methodology. Today, I want to bring some more details and some thoughts about uh, what we've learned and where we're headed. Let's get straight to the headline. The total estimated carbon dioxide emissions from the 2019 event, including on-site emissions and travel to and from the event for all participants, staff, service providers, infrastructure deliveries and servicing is 54,241 metric tons. That's equivalent to a whopping 11,800 passenger vehicles being driven for a year or yikes, burning 60 million pounds of coal. Can you guess what percentage of emissions from this inventory are from travel versus operations and living on site on the playa? For those of you who are able, put your guess into the chat. I'll give you five seconds. That should be enough time to mentally calculate 80,000 people's behavior patterns, right? Let's see what you've got. Our calculations showed that 91% of emissions came from air and ground travel, and 9% of emissions resulted from on-site activities. Burners come from all over the world, so we knew we'd be looking at some significant numbers. What we didn't know was that burners come from 5,562 cities around the world. This says a lot about our cultural impact and a lot about our environmental impact too. When we think about air travel from these places, we wanna look at air miles traveled so we can compute emissions. Any guesses on number of miles flown in and out of Black Rock City? I'll give you a hint, nearly 24,000 people flew on some portion of their journey to Black Rock City in 2019. Let's see how close you were. Our estimate is 130.5 million. These air miles traveled are part of what contributes to our rich cultural fabric of Black Rock City, but also a major way that we contribute to climate change. Let's switch gears to ground travel. We estimated burner miles traveled and the types of vehicles and loads coming into Black Rock City, including contractors with toilets, heavy equipment rentals, 
water trucks, temporary buildings for our operational center, centers and waste hauling, our ice vendor, uh, lots of large vehicles and trucks with heavy loads and our own infrastructure that you see everywhere in Black Rock City, the nine mile perimeter fence and gate road materials, center camp, shade structures, fleet vehicles, staff quarters, our operations offices, and our tech and comms equipment. And of course, the magic of Black Rock City, art projects, theme camps, mutant vehicles, all of this needs to be transported to the site, which is remote and back again. And you can see 49 million land miles. We adjust that for ride sharing and come up with 23 million miles. Here's, look at this um, photo from Maxar Technologies in 2019. This is cars waiting on Gate Road to enter the event. This is a visual snapshot of vehicle traffic. There are upwards of 30,000 vehicle trips into Black Rock City. And also let's just admire the work of our DPW and gate teams. Here's a summary of emissions by mode of travel to Black Rock City showing metric tons of carbon emissions per sector and the percentage of each towards the whole. It's not quite as simple as land or air since air travels, travelers also travel by land on their way to the airport or from the Reno airport or other regional airport to Black Rock City, for example. The takeaway here is that emissions from air travel and land travel are nearly equivalent overall. Let's look at the results as imagined for each person traveling to Black Rock City. I have to switch to a bar chart here so I don't drive Matt crazy. <laughs> There's a lot of data on this slide. See that people who journey to Black Rock City only by land and who ride share have the lowest emissions per person. Some of our plans for a more sustainable future include closer storage options and work capabilities for mutant vehicles, art projects, and theme camps on the 360 acres we own just north of the Y in Gerlach. We implemented Burner Express Bus and Burner Express Air years ago to reduce vehicle trips, and those programs have been successful. But we know people still have to move their gear and supplies to the playa and back. Key questions for us all, how do we reduce what we take? what is achievable given our needs for health and safety and our desires for creativity. It's a good start, but we need a lot more. Are you ready to talk about on playa emissions? Carbon emissions on site come from many sources and do note the total emissions um, for on playa carbon is 5,341 metric tons. I want to give you a visual representation, especially for those of you who haven't been to Black Rock City, of some of the sources, including driving of staff vehicles, mutant vehicles, law enforcement, infrastructure and service contractors, generators running to provide power for air conditioning, for RVs and office spaces, cooking, building, uh, sound amplification and lights, electricity and fuel, uh, needed for multiple purposes, including for emergency services. And on playa carbon emissions include art burns. So let's dive into some of the particulars. We analyzed fuel consumption by camp size and extrapolated known data from placed camps and the BRC petrol program to unplaced camps and those who bring their own fuel. We were able to approximate RV fuel use and shared camp generator fuel use by camp size. It's probably no surprise that larger camps use more fuel. All told, camps and campers used about 300,000 gallons of fuel in their generators and propane tanks, emitting about 2,500 metric tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's about 4.6% of all emissions in our inventory and about 48.5% of on playa emissions. The stats for mutant vehicles are 21,000 gallons of fuel burned for driving, emitting about 182 metric tons of CO2, and 8,400 gallons of propane for flame effects, emitting approximately 48 metric tons. That's 0.4% of all emissions in our inventory and 5.6% of on playa emissions. 
Let's move on to Burning Man production infrastructure. These are our service and in equipment providers, staff vehicles and generators, emergency services, government agencies, center camp and other community spaces. You can see that our impact as an organization with the services and infrastructure we provide towards community services and public health and safety on Playa is about 1,505 metric tons of CO2 or 2.8% of our total inventory and 28% on site. Let's talk about art burns. The main event in Black Rock City is the man burn. It's the central spectacle where we gather and celebrate. There are fireworks and flames, smoke is visible, emissions are obvious, but also relatively low. The man and man pavilion, as you can see here, uh, actually, I think I have a typo there, emitted 76.7 metric tons of CO2. That's 0.1% of the total inventory and only 1.4% of emissions on site. And you can see the temple burn emitted about 41 metric tons and other art burns about 116. Art projects also used an additional 9,600 gallons of fuel for logistics resulting in about 68 metric tons of CO2. So all in all, art projects accounted for three, about 302 metric tons. And the man burn is a tiny fraction of the inventory and a central feature of the event, as is the temple burn. Several pieces of art additionally are burned each year. We're looking at art burns right now. We're asking important questions. What types of burns and how many? What are the alternatives? Can we better support artists in sustainability, including placing more art in cities after Black Rock City? So carbon reduction will continue to play a very important role toward our environmental sustainability goals. How do we use less fuel? How do we use no fuel? We hear from folks every year that vehicle traffic in BRC is an issue. Where can we scale back? One of the most important pieces of feedback we received after the 2021 alternative event in the Black Rock Desert, in fact, one of the things many of us at Burning Man Project experienced for ourselves was that less is more, less can be great, simple can be liberating. People talked about getting back to our roots. One of the richest conversations we're having right now is this exploration of a nexus of reduction and simplicity and richness of experience and safety. But we're asking ourselves, what changes can we make? How do we take advantage of this moment in time and make some bold moves towards simplicity and sustainability? The second is replacement of existing systems with new ones. How can we incorporate and incentivize more electric vehicles, for example? We have to consider the source of electricity too. Burning fuel to run EVs isn't sustainable. How do we power Black Rock City with renewable clean energy? And finally, removal. And that's what we're here to share with each other today. Over to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Marnie, and thanks to you and Jesse for all the work that you put into that. It's a really substantial effort and has set up what we'll be doing next. Um, so next up to talk a little more about uh, the carbon cycle and set up what comes next in our discussion will be Mira, if you would like to go ahead and present Mira. Oh, All right, are we up? Yes. Perfect. Um, thanks so much for this opportunity. My name is Mira Atreya. I'm a senior science analyst at Carbon Direct. I'll give you a brief overview of who we are and what we do, and then talk more about the carbon reduction, removal, and utilization landscape. So very briefly, our team at Carbon Direct is composed of top scientists and academics who lead research on a range of carbon management solutions. And we use the scientific scientific expertise to do two things. First, we support clients in taking action on climate change by helping them implement scientifically, implement and scientifically vet carbon management solutions. And then second, we also invest in technology to help scale the carbon removal and utilization um, landscape. So understanding carbon reduction, removal and utilization. Very simply, there is too much carbon in the atmosphere. At its most basic level, we need to do two things. We need to stop adding carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere urgently, immediately, and at unprecedented scale. At the same time, we also need to actively take CO2 out. And the unfortunate reality is that it's not enough just to mitigate our emissions. 
we need to actively remove carbon if we're going to have any chance of meeting our climate goals. So we have to do both in order to restore balance to the atmosphere and the carbon cycle. So there are a wide range of strategies for carbon removal specifically. And these include those in the managed ecosystem bucket, which include planting trees, restoring coastal ecosystems, improving forest management, restoring peatland and wetlands, and increasing carbon in the soil. These have a lot of co-benefits for people and nature. There are also other technologies that are either a hybrid or fully engineered, and those solutions include bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and direct air capture, which you'll hear a lot more about today, um, and a number of other technologies. And then there are also emerging technologies such as seaweed cultivation or advanced plant cultivars, um, novel soil tech, and the bottom line here is that there are a lot of different potential solutions, some of which are more developed than others, and a combination of these methods will need to be deployed. So we need many of these solutions all at once. Um, and again, their particular technological readiness varies. So at Carbon Direct, we aim to drive the carbon removal market towards projects of high integrity. And what that means is that we scientifically evaluate whether projects receiving carbon credits are indeed additional to what would have happened without carbon financing, so comparing it to a baseline, um, and that their carbon accounting is robust, that projects do not do harm to surrounding ecosystems or communities, and that ideally they actually have co-benefits for both, um, that projects foster also community involvement. So we evaluate whether carbon that is being sequestered is also at risk of being re-released and whether carbon removal activities might cause displacement of emissions from one site to the other, that's called leakage. So all of these are very important for determining whether projects that, that claim to do carbon dioxide removal are actually of high quality and really are removing carbon. Couple examples of how we've used our scientific expertise to help our partners meet climate goals is uh, with Microsoft, for example, we developed with them criteria for high quality carbon removal um, and also have done scientific diligence on more than 50 carbon removal projects across forestry and soil, bioenergy, direct air capture. We supported GSK to design a net zero carbon and nature and health positive strategy. Um, and recently published a report with Shopify on how to reduce emissions from transportation over the Black Friday weekend. So a couple, these are sort of general um, examples of what we do at, at Carbon Direct, which is really trying to take the science lens on how we can stimulate um, this carbon removal market and make it one of high integrity. If you have any questions, I would direct you to our website or you're welcome to email me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mira. Appreciate you being on today. Thanks for the presentation. Next up, we have Matt Atwood uh, from Air Capture, who will be telling us about their project. Matt, take it away. Hey, thanks, Matt. Um, my name is Matt Atwood. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I am the founder and CEO of Air Capture. I'm also a scientist and fellow with Blackrock Labs and a board uh, member of Southern Beams Builds, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Um, to get started, I'd like to provide a little bit of background on the importance of negative carbon, negative carbon infrastructure, and where in reality I believe we are with regards to emission reduction targets and why carbon reduction removal is on the critical path. Um, it's imperative to view emission reduction targets as a, an overall carbon budget. Uh, fundamentally, there's a limit to how much carbon we can move from underground and put it into the atmosphere without causing existential climate change and tripping climate feedback mechanisms. Uh, and the longer we wait to start reducing, the less likely we are to reach these critical path climate targets. So where are we today? Uh, on the left here is the latest report from the UNEP regarding the planned fossil fuel projections. And if you look at where we're planned to be going now with various different countries' commitments and where we need to be, 
we're not currently reducing by 4%, which would be required uh, to hit the two degrees targets. Uh, we're, we're up above 50% of that number. So the reality is, is it's not possible to achieve these targets without negative carbon technology. So what does it look like to develop negative carbon technology and get to negative? Uh, this is an analysis I've done looking at emission reduction projections um, by the latest information from climate scientists and uh, what would be the required negative emission infrastructure to avoid two degrees of warming, have a high confidence interval of such. Um, as you can see below, um, it would require a net reduction of existing um, emissions together with a rapid development and negative emission infrastructure to the point of about two gigatons per year by 2050 of added capacity uh, to avoid um, the uh, putting too much CO2 into the atmosphere over the 2020 baseline. And, um, but this isn't just, you know, a, a cause for alarm. Um, this is an incredible economic opportunity moving forward. So what we're doing at Air Capture is we have a process that pulls CO2 out of the air. It's a pretty simple process. We have fans that drive uh, air through our, uh, through our contactors. Contactors you can think of like bricks. Uh, they're, they're porous bricks with a special chemical on them. And then we release that what, as the air goes through the bricks, the CO2 is absorbed from the air or combinations of air and potentially flue gas streams or higher concentrations of CO2, adsorbed down to the substrate surface, and then we use low grade heat to remove the CO2 from it, collecting the CO2 and then doing something useful with it. <clears throat> Our approach is modular distributed scale direct air capture where we produce CO2 on site at any scale. On left, you can see an image of a 100 metric ton direct air capture machine. It's about the size of a refrigerator to give you a sense of context. Our approach is producing CO2 on site where it's needed for a number of different applications. And this distributed modular scale system can be used to produce CO2 that can be used directly, such as in beverages or dry ice or refrigeration, or to produce a number of different products, fertilizers, textiles, carbon black, battery materials, et cetera. So here's this uh, concept on DAC integration systems approach to produce uh, fuel. What if Burning Man built a gas station in the desert that made fuel from air, leveraging solar assets the rest of the year? Hydrocarbons are just hydrogen and carbon, right? Uh, all the fuel from underground came from sunlight, atmospheric, and CO2 from millions of years ago. We can speed that process up. And based on some of the numbers Marnie just shared, each modular solar system coupled to DAC could potentially address up to 1% of the on ply emissions. And that fuel could be sold on site to art cars and, and uh, start addressing the highest carbon intensity of energy in the event and start potentially generating some revenue. So to wrap up, carbon neutral is not enough. We can't get to the emission target reductions from where we are here without negative carbon infrastructure. Drawdown of future emissions is not enough either. We have to do more than that. And the timing is critical. We have maybe 20 years to solve the problem. Proposed solutions that have a long tail of drawdown aren't gonna solve the problem, but it's not all scary. With, with these kinds of approaches, we can generate significant economic opportunities and we can begin to build it together. Thank you. Stoked to be here talking about Burning Man and sustainability. Very apropos to that is this photo which hangs in our bedroom here behind us. This is my burn mitzvah celebration uh, that Amanda threw for me. And as part of that, I asked the question, well, you know, I've been doing this amazing event for 13 years now. <clears throat> and what can I do to give back? So I started poking around around Burning Man and sustainability, and I began the long road of um, a bunch of efforts, including uh, the Burning Man Carbon Offset Program and blah, blah, blah. And so it's so great to have the most open hearts and live minds of our generation here, all putting our noodles together to talk about what we can do. And so we'll talk a little bit specifically about sort of our day jobs, as it were, um, and Amanda can kick that off. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Great to be here, everyone. Um, very much inspired by time on Playa. Uh, I am fully dedicated to working on balancing the carbon cycle. I was the co-founder of Project Drawdown, uh, 
which created this really great map um, of our emissions and drawdown. Also a great book if those uh, haven't seen it of a hundred different solutions to climate change, emphasizing drawdown solutions, so carbon capture um, and storage solutions. So just want to point people here uh, to, you know, these are today's sources and sinks and just a huge shout out and gratitude to land sinks and coastal and ocean sinks for taking up uh, nearly half of the carbon uh, that we put into the atmosphere. And just noting the, you know, the food and ag emission source here is about a quarter um, and we can reduce that to zero through changing our food and, and agriculture and land practices and increase over here. And then Kelly will speak uh, later about how we can increase this blue line of the ocean sinks. Um, so that's a really handy graph you can find at drawdown.org. And uh, yeah, what we found with doing this analysis of the, over the next 30 years, what, what are the climate climactic and financial impacts of um, all the carbon solutions or all the climate solutions that we have, we found that food and land are actually 12 of the top 20 solutions. Everything from tropical staple tree crops, and, you know, using perennial agriculture to, you know, you having a plant rich diet or reducing food waste. Uh, there's a lot that we can all do as individuals, as communities, and I think most importantly as burners, as influencers, um, you know, and not just Instagram influencers, but we all have uh, really the capacity to set culture. I see Burning Man as this trim tab of setting culture uh, around the world and want to encourage us all to not just think about what are the exact you know, tons, which is important, but also how can we influence uh, others in thinking about these things in a different way. So May now I, I run- interrupt, um, but um, your Zoom toolbar is blocking part of your presentation. Oh, okay. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Let's see, let's do that. That's because I'm optimizing for video. Stop that, start again. How's that? Looks great. Okay, great. So I moved over from Drawdown to run the Buckminster Fuller Institute and our main project is called Regenerosity. Uh, and it's about tying together these hubs around the world that are working on regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture is about balancing the carbon cycle but also doing so in a way that alleviates poverty uh, and creates as many cascading benefits, co-benefits that you know create uh, themselves more and more. And so we're, that's what we're doing. You can find out more at regenerosity.world, but essentially we see this trim tab of uh, regenerative agriculture hubs around the world that are working with the 500 million smallholder farmers uh, who produce 80% of our food around the world. And uh, many of whom are indigenous or have you know, ties to their indigenous heritage uh, more closely and have the, those practices at hand. And so we're enabling them doing capacity development uh, and partnering with a lot of really great family offices to be able to be a flow through for, for funding for them. Um, indigenous people steward about 5% of the world and 85% of the world's biodiversity. So in terms of climate, but also biodiversity and you know, a resilient earth going forward, it's really critical work. Um, and I'm grateful to be able to work on that. And here's a... Uh, visual showing those cascading benefits. So regenerative agriculture enables people to have more nutrient dense food. Those nutrients then enable them to, you know, have higher income, educate their children, invest in their community. And each of those has kind of like this jetty of reinforcement um, back into previous parts of the, the benefit cycle. And it's across all forms of capital. So also looking at carbon drawdown enables healthy soil, which enables climate resilience, which enables water retention, which enables more richness of biodiversity. And each of these kind of have these, these loops back, these virtuous cycles. Um, so much of the extractive economy that has led us to this meta crisis right now is because of other reinforcing feedback loops, but of you know weaponry begetting poison, begetting you know, pesticides, and you know, excessive fertilizers, which are causing eutrophication and these dead zones in the, in the ocean. What's the opposite of that, that where we can kind of spark runaway regeneration instead of runaway uh, climate change. And yeah, I'll pass it over to Ryan, but just wanna encourage folks to come and be a member of Buckminster Fuller Institute and join us in learning and research and supporting these projects around the world. Thanks all. Uh, then I'll touch on really briefly my sort of uh, day job as I run this, uh, program, Third Derivative, we're a climate technology accelerator program 
Uh, we're a joint venture between the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a big global think tank, and the New Energy Nexus. Uh, we take in 15 to 20 climate tech uh, companies a quarter. So anything in energy and storage, transportation, buildings, industry, we have a whole new cohort sponsored by the Grantham Foundation that's, that is uh, just direct air capture. And so we're doing the first gigaton captured um, and we're trying to drive down the cost of specifically that technology. Um, also, Kelly, who's presenting later, Vesta is now in the program as well. And so we're a big, giant virtual global program. And I would encourage you to check it out. And if you're working on an enterprise, uh, enter. And if you're sort of earlier on the uh, sort of development, you're learning, this is a screenshot of the New Energy Network. This is over 4,000 um, climate technology innovation organizations and people. And uh, the link will be posted somewhere. And you can join this as a big, supportive, safe space to just sort of get uh, your first step into climate tech. And thanks, guys. Thank you all. Great. I'll jump in. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Hi from Vancouver, Canada. My name is Lori. Um, I work for Carbon Engineering. Carbon Engineering is a director capture technology company. Just a bit of background for me. Um, back in 2012, I had the good fortune to learn about the 10 principles. And then in 2013, I, I had the good fortune to come to Burning Man for a family reunion. So hopefully you can tell by the joy on the faces of the big kids and the little kids, how much um, the Burning Man community resonated with us and how much we appreciated your approach to all things. Um, so it wasn't, a, I was delighted, but not surprised when Matt told me that the Burning Man project had a goal to remove more carbon from the environment than you've put into it. So fantastic, fabulous. I'm happy to be here to answer questions and happy to support any way I can. I won't go into how we got into this mess because um, you've had some really good speakers talk about that. Um, just a note as we get into it, uh, that the, the place where we got those fossil fuels from in the first place, which brought us abundant, cheap energy, but unfortunately also is polluting the environment is one of the key places where we're gonna be putting some of that uh, carbon back underground. Carbon Engineering was founded back in 2009. Um, our founder, David Keith, was an advisor to Bill Gates on climate. And um, at the time, uh, you know, Bill said, what's it gonna take to solve climate change? And the world wasn't really talking about carbon removal yet um, at scale, but David said, I, I think we're in trouble and somebody's gonna need to remove a lot of carbon from the atmosphere in order to help solve climate change. And so uh, Bill Gates gave us some seed funding and away we went. And our vision is to lead the world in affordable, large-scale removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, okay, so uh, lead the world in affordable, large-scale removal of carbon dioxide um, and help us. Being one of the tools in the toolbox, we need to do all of the above to solve climate change, but help accelerate our shift to a sustainable society. In terms of our technology, um, we, uh, we have a process that, that's uh, similar to other processes. We published um, an open publication back in 2018 of all of our technology, the chemistry and the economics of the capital and the operating expenses and how we'll get there. So, um, so I've provided that and you can take a look at that to see the details. Um, what you'll find is that for us uh, since the outset, our focus has always been on a one megaton plant. So the, a plant that removes a million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere per year at a target cost point of $100 a ton. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, it's not magic to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We've known how to do so for decades and that's how we put people in spacecraft and submarines. We scrub out the CO2 that we exhale. The challenge was that we didn't know how to do that at really large scale and at low cost. And we felt that getting to $100 a ton for the removal, permanent removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere was something that would make it affordable to be a tool in the toolbox to help us get to solving climate change. Of course, we must reduce everywhere we can first. And then we also need to remove uh, some of the CO2 from the atmosphere. For every ton that still gets emitted, we need to permanently remove a ton from the atmosphere. 
I just want to talk a little bit about the, the absolute number of CO2 molecules that we have floating around us. And it, it's really a carbon math problem, and I'm an engineer. So um, we hear a lot about people trying to get to net zero, which is really important. That means for every ton that's emitted, we, we remove a ton from the atmosphere. But it's also important to think about going past net zero and drawing down some of that excess CO2 from the atmosphere as you're doing and thinking about um, by going carbon negative at Burning Man. We have lots of technologies that we're working on today. We all know about wind and solar, which are really important. Um, you know, biofuels, hydrogen, other ways to reduce today's emissions. And direct air capture can help there. We can offset uh, an emission from today, or we can turn that carbon into a synthetic fuel, which helps us burn that fuel instead of using a fossil fuel that we've brought up out of the geosphere up into that active biosphere. Um, but that's that's today's emissions. We, we emit about 50 gigatons uh, today, which is four and a half million tons of CO2 entering the atmosphere every hour, which is a daunting task. But the task is bigger than that again, um, because if we emit 50 gigatons and we need to remove about a trillion tons to get back to safe levels, that makes today's emissions only 5% of the problem. We also need to go tackle that those historical emissions and start to remove that legacy CO2 as well. We don't have enough solutions there yet. Uh, director captures one. Um, Mira went through some of them, Beck's ocean alkalinity, enhancement and mineralization. We need to develop um, and deploy more of these, all of these technologies to draw down that excess CO2 in the atmosphere. We think at Carbon Engineering, um, the director capture brings, uh, you know, some new tools to the toolbox and some missing pieces in those net, net zero plans. So we can, um, once we've captured the CO2, just safely part, put it back into the geosphere, um, into underground storage uh, that will take it back out of the active biosphere and remove it from, from those climate impacts. Or um, as, as Lisa said, carbon is just a building block and we can turn that carbon that we captured from the atmosphere into carbon products like um, fuels and those those are known techniques to turn carbon into fuel we can make renewable diesel rene renewable jet fuel um, that then will go back through combustion back up into the atmosphere but now we're recycling the carbon from the atmosphere rather than having to pull new fossil fuel out of the ground and adding all of that carbon up into the to the active biosphere and at carbon engineering we've done we've done that as well we've produced on spec drop-in compatible diesel and jet fuel um, just to prove uh, how it works or to show that it works and to prove out the economics. In terms of where we're at as a company, um, we've been operating our pilot plan since 2015 and we're doing just finishing hot commissioning of our innovation center, which will be our permanent home for research and development. Uh, we're also about over 150, 185,000 person hours into the design of our first full scale plant which will remove a million tons per year. That plant will be in Texas and that plant will serve the California low carbon fuel standard, California with world leading policies on decarbonizing. Um, so we will do removals at that plant. And then we're designing plants all around the world and working with project developers. We're a technology company. We license our technology to project developers who build, own, operate those plants. So we're excited to be working with a few that we've announced and more that we haven't announced yet to work on both direct air capture plants as well as the conversion to liquid fuels, which we call air to fuels. In terms of co-benefits, there's lots. We, we focus mostly on the removal of carbon from the atmosphere, but we create jobs. Uh, we do so in a really tight engineering package where we use a lot less land and water than, than biological approaches. Because of that smaller land footprint, there's opportunities hopefully gonna be for rewilding um, because we, we're doing this air pollution cleanup um, in a small footprint. Um, we can do so on non-arable land. We don't need arable land. We can build these plants anywhere you have access to air and water and clean energy. Um, so typically you would put great big uh, deck plants on top of those geologic reservoirs where we're gonna put the CO2 back underground, uh, create jobs, safe, safe levels of atmospheric CO2. Um, and we can support international climate justice in terms of being able to remove that legacy carbon addresses the intergenerational justice aspects but we'll also be able to create jobs um, and have the global north able to help the global south in terms of um, the build out of the clean infrastructure and the creation of jobs and the ability to get to net zero and then remove that legacy carbon. I've also just got a, a little picture when we look at the co-benefits of air to fuels plants um, because it's a nice, pure, clean hydro hydrocarbon without the sulfur and particulates. It's also clean burning, so you get air quality benefits as well. In terms of the need for speed, um, you know, it's all about the carbon math and, uh, you know, we're, 
we hear things like we have about eight, less than eight years in the carbon budget. That's because when we measure the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, we know exactly we're adding about two, two parts per million e each year, which means we're, we're less than eight years away from 430 parts per million, um, which is about uh, one and a half degrees of warming on our way, unfortunately, to 450 at two degrees. So we need to slow down our emissions, remove what we can't uh, avert, avoid and then ideally go backward in time and remove that one trillion tons to get back to safe levels. At Carbon Engineering, we believe that direct air capture will help help us to restore that carbon balance, um, complementing in all of the above approach, all of the other things we need to do to help solve climate change. And final thoughts, um, this is the Union of Concerned Scientists. They said, you know, fortunately climate change is solvable and, and as an engineer and as and looking at all the different solutions, we actually know how to solve climate change. We know how to get to net zero. We could afford it. We know how much it costs. We could afford to do it. And it's just a choice we need to be making. Um, but there's lots of people talking about it uh, and talking about who else should be doing something. And so, uh, you know, I was delighted to see in the carbon negative roadmap that, um, that, that you're looking at taking action and absolutely smiled when I read that the potential global impact of the Burning Man incubator is infinite. It really is. And people taking action, learning, sharing what they learn and taking action um, is incredibly important and meaningful today. So I absolutely believe, I think I might've borrowed this photo from Will Roger from my family archive. Um, I absolutely believe in what you're doing and, and would like to support any way I can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lori. Good to see you. <laughs> Next up, we will have Daniel from Climeworks. Daniel, go ahead and take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, great to be here and being the third speaker about direct air capture. So um, hopefully I can I can uh, compliment, compliment the picture a little bit on, on direct air capture. And uh, also thanks to, to Laurie and, and, and Matt speaking about this topic before, so um, that you already know a little bit on, on what you're doing. Um, we have already touched this topic, why we need carbon dioxide removals, why we need direct air capture and storage. But let me also a little bit to el elaborate what, what is the potential of this technology and also what is not. Um, we need to get to net zero by mid of this of the century. That's, that's no way around that. And we need to be net negative in the second half of the century. The first strategy always needs to be that we reduce our CO2 emissions as much as we can. And there, where we, where we still need to rely on carbon or uh, hydrocarbons, that we close, that we that we form a, a closed carbon cycle. Direct air cap capture can take care of the unavoidable emissions, which we cannot reduce or, or avoid in, with with other technologies. So it's it's not uh, a silver bullet for for everything, but it is a part of an entire portfolio to uh, to to get to net zero. When we talk about net zero. Um, where do we have the drivers today behind that? Free from Climeworks, we see we see a very strong push from the from the the, the, the economies, from the from the from from big from big corporates. We see a lot of net zero pledges, and we also see that that companies start to react and also to, to start to implement such strategies and take the responsibility to, uh, to reduce their emissions to net zero and some even even further. We also see that um, following this, the, the, a lot of governments are take, taking actions as well. Two years ago, three years ago, this, this problem was still a little bit different, but we, we see that this net zero target really has, has, uh, has, uh, has right mainstream, which uh, in our point of view is really necessary um, that we can solve the climate crisis. Here, just a, a couple of names we have already seen today uh, of, of companies who are taking actions and which are driving these, these net zero targets as fast as they can. And we also see here that there are big names. So a lot of big companies, they have realized that without taking care on the climate, that probably um, they're going to face issues in the future and they, they have realized that they have to start now. When we talk about carbon dioxide removals, then um, we, we, we need to think about what we what kind of, of criteria we need to apply. There are a lot of different solutions out there. And um, today I would say there's not no also no single solutions. We can basically take everything. We need to, to think for also from a portfolio approach, we need to, to have to apply different solutions to, to tackle this problem. So for something which we need to keep in mind, for example, is, is storage permanence. 
CO2 remains in the atmosphere many thousands years, many 10,000 years, or even 100,000 years. So we need to find solutions which have the storage capability to store the CO2 basically forever, that it doesn't come back to the atmosphere and that we're just handing over the problem, not to, maybe not to our children, but to our grandchildren. We also need to see that we have, we have solutions which are scalable enough. By 2050, we need to remove between five and 10, and some scientists say even more, uh, billion tons of, of CO2 every year. That's massive. So we need to have technologies which, uh, which, which, can, which can do the job, which are scalable enough, and that they're not creating uh, an unintended uh, side effects, so that we're not creating other problems than, uh, than uh, the, the one we're we are trying to solve. So um, in, in the future, also in the future, we're going to see different solutions there because we see that different solutions are adding different benefits to, uh, to, uh, to solve this problem. We have nature-based solutions, which are already available today to a certain, to a certain amount, which have, which have great benefits like biodiversity uh, and so on, if you do it the right way. But we also need technical solutions um, to, to enable the, the, the storage permanence and also the scalability uh, of the technologies. Um, how do we see direct air captures climb works or how do we do it? How do, does our, uh, does our uh, technology works? The core of our technology, the core of our machine is a, a, a metal box with a size of about two meters, which we're calling CO2 collector. And inside this metal box, we do have a filter material and we draw uh, ambient air through this filter material. And then the CO2 sticks basically on the surface of this filter. When this filter is saturated, we're going to a second process step and we release the CO2 again by heating it up. So when you heat up this filter material to 100, 120 degrees, the CO2 is released again. Therefore, we, we, we use uh, renewable energy like, like geothermal uh, to run our plants. You can repeat this cycle many, many times, so many, many thousand times. So it's a regenerative process so that you can, uh, to, uh, to, that you can remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. What's, now I would like to talk a little bit about our project we have in Iceland, about the ORCA project. We're running our plant, our CO2 capture plant, with the energy of a nearby geothermal power plant. So we're getting the, the heat and electricity to run our, our plant, and we extract the CO2 out of the air. The CO2 then we're mixing together with water. So basically, we're creating a high, highly concentrated fizzy water. And this fissive water we're pumping, or our partner Carpfix, is pumping deep underground, several hundred meters underground. And there, the CO2 starts to react with the local rock formation. So we basically turn CO2 into stone. And by doing that, we store the CO2 forever. The water then again is heated up and, and comes up to the atmosphere. So we also create a closed, uh, a closed uh, water cycle. Here are a couple of pictures of the, of the plant, uh, as it looks like. So this is the, the orca plant with uh, eight of such, of such collectors, capturing around 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide every year, which are pumping underground. Here you see a picture on the upper right uh, from the time where the plant was still in construction. And what you see, what you see down here, this, um, this, this stone here with the white dots here, the white dots, are the, the, the mineralized CO2, uh, which, which Carpfix took out of the ground from several hundred meters. So uh, 4,000 tons, that's, that's not enough. So that's the emissions of around, uh, of around 500 German uh, citizens uh, per year. So that's, that's not sufficient. So we need to see that we scale up this technology as fast as possible. So the next step we're going to do is a 40,000 ton um, plant, which will go in operation by 2024. So our engineers are already working heavily on this. So uh, we're, we started this project um, so that we can, we can put this plant into operation uh, in about three years from now. And then after that, we are going to increase the capacity by a factor of 10 every, every three years. So this is the, the, the scale up uh, which, we, which we see, which is possible. So that we end up by, by 2030 on a level of a couple of million tons of carbon dioxide removal by direct air capture per year. This is also necessary because we have seen also, also or, or heard from the presentation from, uh, from before that speed is an important issue here. We need to solve this problem within the next 30 years. So we need to have technologies today which are scalable enough to do the job. 
If you're still on a research state and we need to, to test it, if something is going to work, we will be too late. So we need to see that we really bring speed into this and scale it up as, a, as, a, as, as, as fast as possible. But here at Climeworks, we're also convinced that a company alone cannot do this job. So our vision is that we can inspire 1, mil, 1 billion people to re remove carbon dioxide from the air. So we need all of you starting to create a movement to, uh, to, to uh, take the CO2 we have out there to take it back and store it forever. Thank you very much and have a great day. I'll just go ahead then. So um, we're myself and Antonia. So just to give us a bit of a background, we uh, come from the construction industry. I'm a structural engineer. And Antonio is an architect. Um, I work for Bureau Happeld Engineering and Antonio works for Populous. And we've been involved in the construction industry for at least quite a number of projects for the last six years. And essentially, we want to summarize um, the way the in, where the industry is heading and um, how embodied carbon is being addressed in the industry because as time goes by people are becoming more aware of the impact of how certain materials are you know creating this huge embodied carbon impact um and you know it needs to be addressed um through better design and management so in terms of construction uh, even if you're not involved in building the buildings you use buildings it's it's you know one of the biggest things that affects the landscape around you so it's good to be aware of what goes into making those buildings. So when we speak about embodied carbon in construction, it usually refers to the amount of CO2 emitted throughout the whole transportation, manufacture, construction, and refurbishment of buildings, so throughout their whole life. Um, and this is usually multiple gases are admitted, so it's usually calculated as an embodied carbon equivalent. Um, one thing to note on what this graph shows is most of the embodied carbon is emitted in the construction. So the first bar on this graph shows a building up to its completion of the construction. Then throughout the rest of its life, its emissions are pretty controllable, except for you know, certain instances where you need to make some maintenance or you know, do some works to that building. Um, and then the end of life, stage of the building there's quite a lot of uh, carbon associated with the demolition but it's usually the the construction which is the big chunk of it and that's the part which we have the most control over um, now this is a bit technical and this is um, how it's being addressed in construction what happens is uh, we're dividing it into modules um, and each module covers the whole cycle of a building's life so it starts with um, the construction stage, which is module A, then the use stage and the end of life stage. And the ideal scenario is that we design it from what's called cradle to cradle. So from when the building's born to its, its reuse. Um, and that's what everyone's targeting. But the main focus at the moment is specifically its construction, because that's where all the carbon tends to be. Um, here, this is an interesting graph, especially for the people involved in the design of buildings um, in any shape or form. So not necessarily just architects or engineers. It could be, you know, someone building their own house. The, the biggest impact you have on the embodied carbon in your building is in the beginning when you're making the decisions about your design. So um, it's usually at the very early stages of the project where you can make some decisions that will, you know, make the project more carbon efficient or save you know, tons of carbon in the choice of materials um, and the construction system to use. As time goes by throughout the process, um, there's very little that can be done um, and it gets harder and harder as, as time goes by. So it's really all about thinking about the whole process from the very beginning and making some really intelligent decisions towards the end. So it's a really simple formula. So how do you calculate embodied carbon um, in construction, there's a material quantity, which is usually given as a volume. It's times by a unit, um, and that just gives us the, the amount of embodied, to, uh, embodied carbon. Now, the, the tricky bit is coming up with that factor to multiply the volume of material by. Um, there's a, this is very early stages, so um, there is some research being done uh, throughout the world. Everyone's gathering data. 
Um, it isn't complete, so this, this information is always changing. These, uh, the graph on the screen shows some values specifically based, uh, specifically based around the UK construction industry. Um, and one thing I'd like to note, so depending on where you are in the world, these values change. So in, in, in Europe, which is very similar to the US, there's a certain amount of recycling that is um, basically required in, in especially steel production and a bit of recycle, recycling of concrete. In other parts of the world, that might not be necessary. So these, value, these values do change. So on this graph, just for comparison, I've put in two values, uh, which is the savings that um, a vegan saves throughout the whole year. So according to uh, the independent newspaper, which is a British newspaper in 2020. So that's around 800 kilos, which is 0.8 of a ton. Um, a long haul flight with the return is around 1.6 tons. Um, whilst all the construction materials there are a cubic meter of that material. So something the size of an armchair of aluminium is around you know, 18 tons of, of CO2 in, in the atmosphere. So that's a huge amount compared to you know, or even what a vegan can save. But in construction, aluminium is usually used mainly very sparingly. It's in, you know, the windows, not really, you don't build a whole building out of aluminium. It's usually the steel and the concrete, which where all the, the CO2 is, is usually really released into the atmosphere. So concrete is not too bad on the list in terms of, you know, CO2 per, per cubic meter, but when you think about it, a cubic meter of concrete um, is, is essentially, you know, a bit less than what a column would be. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of concrete being used and even small decisions can save a lot of CO2 in the design. Um, just some breakdown of different construction systems. So concrete and flat slab tend to be the most common whilst timber is the most efficient in terms of uh, CO2 based on the values I showed you before, but it comes with its own issues. So there's usually some composite design like with the steel mixed with timber. Each one of them has their benefits. Uh, essentially what this graph is showing is green is good, red is bad, and um, in terms of CO2 emissions. So you want to be designing interior with more timber or at least being intelligent to how you use materials. But timber comes with its own problems because it's, it sequesters, it stores CO2, but it all depends on what you do with the timber after. If you're going to dispose of it in landfill or burn it, then it's going to release that CO2 that you saved anyway back into the atmosphere. So it's all about you know, planning for the full use of, of it. Um, and a bit more about what targets we want to achieve. So there's different targets. Essentially, by uh, past 2030, we want to achieve a net zero. So at the moment, we're not there yet. But as time goes by in the construction industry and how buildings are built, we're going to push towards that. And this can be done in, very, in many ways. So in a typical building, it's usually the floors, which cont you know, contain the most material and the most CO2. It's just basically the way it is. The foundations as well take up a lot of material and CO2. So that's where you know, intelligent design comes in. Also building height, the higher you get, the more CO2, because as you get higher, the structure gets bigger, the columns get bigger, the foundation gets bigger. So everything increases as you get taller. So future routes, simple thing, don't build. That's the easiest answer to you know, stopping this question. Do I need this new, um, I don't know, multi-use sporting arena or, you know, do, do we need this multi-story tower block in the middle of the city? Can we use old, old buildings? Can we repurpose old buildings? Um, so that's a very important question to ask when you're doing this. Offsetting, it's a quick fix, but there's a lot of double counting. There's a lot of controversy with this at the moment. So um, I don't really think it's a, at the, as, it, as it stands, it's, it's a very dangerous just to rely on offsetting. Um, decarbonization of the supply chain is a big thing in construction that can be done. It will really reduce the amount of CO2. Um, and importantly, you know, alternative materials and innovative manufacturing techniques. Now I'll, I'll pass 
the presentation over to my colleague Antonio, who'll talk a bit about our proposal that will try to build in Burning Man based on these, these ideas. Hi everyone. Um, so um, I think you could point to the, the, large, the rather um, dark picture of construction nowadays. Uh, it, the reality is that we are um, emitting a uh, vast percentage of the um, carbon emissions um, globally, and we as designers are responsible for this. Um, the reason why we joined um, the LAGA 2020 competition was because we needed um, a bit of a out of construction industry scenario where we could experiment with materials and develop a rather crazy idea that is a bit more challenging and um, more difficult to execute on large scale projects. So it's a sort of a R and D endeavor. Um, Nico, can you move on to the next slide? And next slide. Um, so we came up with this idea after doing a lot of research. Um, we were very keen on uh, utilizing the local materials on site at the fire ranch, um, which is predominantly um, aggregate, basically, and water. Um, the only way to construct something from uh, that aggregate is um, usually in traditional architecture um, at the cement, uh, which is and basically create concrete, which is really not a solution to the construction industry problems. So we did a lot of research and we found this material ferroc, which um, is quite similar to cement, but um, instead of um, delivering a concrete like, like mixture um, by um, adding uh, cement, um, the binding is happening through uh, the reaction between the CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, the water in the mixture, and also the steel dust, uh, which is a byproduct within um, our mixture. Nico, can I go on? Um, so our proposal is again to use, uh, utilize these local materials and also uh, we'll have to transport the steel dust um, and develop these modular um, arched components that can be aggregated over time and developed over time depending on the needs of the development, which uh, as part of the brief, um, it needs to be as open as flexible as possible because um, the fly ranch site um, on its own is a playground and an experiment and the future of uh, fly ranch is kind of like an open canvas. So our proposal is, um, we have a few different types um, and that responds to the specific uh, climatic conditions within the site. Um, one of them is, let's say in the wetlands, uh, the least um, invasive one, which only provides a sort of a ever evolving platform um, again, generated from the local materials that we find on site. Um, and that platform is used um, entirely for nature walks and for people to experience the uh, beaut beautiful natural habitat of the area. Um, and uh, this image illustrates our idea for the modular system that can develop over time and um, uh, develop shorter structures over time. Um, this image illustrates uh, the two different modules. Uh, we also had this idea about, uh, let's say, introducing vegetation uh, within the modules and incorporating the geometry of um, our arch modules uh, in a way that it allows for vegetation to grow within it, incorporate um, uh, glazed elements uh, to allow for natural lighting. Um, one of the challenges that we need to address is how we actually deal uh, with the construction process, which is why we hope that um, next year, if the travel uh, restrictions uh, during the pandemic allow us to uh, go on site and actually test our idea for uh, developing these uh, panelized components that can be assembled together and um, kind of hung between a uh, timber framing. Next one, Nico. Uh, which again aggregate into uh, the larger dome structures. And this is a picture of a very small prototype that we built uh, during the competition in order to um, test our idea and whether or not uh, the geometries we're thinking of uh, can be achieved. It's quite promising and we're very excited about the opportunity to uh, develop something on a, at a larger scale, uh, hopefully again next year in the US. And thank you very much. And that's all from us.
Thank you so much. Great to see you both. Next up, we'll have Brad. Brad, if you want to go ahead and take it away. I do. Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Brad Ack, and I am executive director of an organization called Ocean Visions. I'm going to do a little bit of a different presentation, uh, more about a whole range of different technologies <clears throat> that might be brought to bear to repair the climate and actually heal the ocean as well. Ocean Visions is a consortium of a number of leading research entities in the ocean sciences and conservation space, partnered with um, private sector actors who help bring ideas from academic laboratories and institutes into uh, commercialization. I just want to start though by um, highlighting a little bit more of the urgency that we face here. One of the biggest problems we have with our climate agenda is that we are not recognizing that we have failed. We have dramatically failed over the last 40 years to address this problem. The graph on the left there is um, over time, all of the different uh, political agreements that we formed while the total emissions of carbon have gone up and up and up. And on the right, you see in 2021, this very year, we still have about 83% of all our energy coming from fossil fuels and that re renewables rose to record highs of 5.7%. And this is none other than uh, uh, BP themselves. So, you know, these numbers, um, I think we can, we can assume aren't inflated. Uh, and you know, at the same time, this failure to address the climate crisis is really creating an ocean crisis. There's two driving threats to the oceans, both of which are caused by too much carbon in the atmosphere. The first is thermal stress with about 93% of all the heat we have trapped inside the biosphere going into the ocean and literally unraveling critical parts of the ocean that all of us depend on. And the second big stress uh, to the ocean is the direct position of carbon that has changed ocean chemistry over the course of the last 150 years, about 30%, which is a threat to all marine life. So at the end of the day, if you are an ocean advocate, or if you're just an advocate for survival on the planet, you have to recognize that the climate agenda has failed and that we have to build a new agenda. We retain the one part that everybody has focused on for the last 60 years, which is reducing emissions. But we have to add the removals, as my colleagues have said over and over today. But there's a third component here. We actually need to repair critical parts of the system that are so damaged and close to or at tipping points that if we lose them, winning the climate battle won't feel like winning at all. So reduce, remove, repair. That's really the new agenda for the climate. And on the reduction side, the numbers that we're facing, uh, this is according to the IPCC, the uh, UN's global science body on climate, are enormous, right? They're on, they, they calculate that between 100 and 1,000 gigatons or 100 billion to 1,000 billion tons of carbon have to be removed over this century. That's just to have a chance of getting to 1.5. The reality is 1.5 is not safe. The 1.5 target is not science, it's political science. You won't find a climate scientist in the world that's legitimate that will tell you that 1.5 is a happy place for humanity or the other species on the planet. We're at 1.1 right now, and it's dangerously unsafe for uh, hundreds of millions of people, as well as many other species. And it's definitely unsafe for the ocean. And stabilizing at 1.5 is highly unlikely because that 1.5 average will be distributed equally, unequally across the globe. And you will see much, much higher temperatures in the Arctic as we already do, which leads to a series of what are called positive feedback loops that are anything but positive and they cause continuing uh, climate change. All of this is to say, we need a much stronger ambition. We need to do everything people on the call have said today, but about we need to 10 exit and then 10 exit again. And we need to recognize that getting to this net zero target by 2050 won't stop, won't cool the planet. It may stop heating it, 
That's not even clear. But the crisis will keep going on for decades, if not centuries. So in order to repair the biosphere and the planet, we have to clean up all this legacy pollution. So now, what roles do the oceans have? 73% of the planet's surface, they already are the largest carbon cycler on the planet. I think the first uh, speaker uh, on, on the carbon cycle spoke to that. There's about 50 times more uh, carbon at the bottom of the ocean than there is in the atmosphere. So adjusting or tweaking uh, the cycles that the, carb that the ocean uses to uh, sequester and store carbon could have a major impact on atmospheric carbon and reducing it. And also there's many fewer conflicts than on land um, and ocean-based CDR, carbon dioxide removal pathways may, pro may provide significant co-benefits. What are some of these pathways? The first is the power of photosynthesis, um, growing either macroalgae or microalgae in the ocean intentionally, increasing the productivity of the ocean to capture carbon. And then there's a myriad number of ways that you can store that carbon. Um, you could sink it to the bottom of the sea, you could harvest it and run it in bio um, reactors to bioenergy reactors to um, create energy and capture the carbon. You can turn it into long life products. There's a number of technology pathways available. Coastal uh, ecosystems uh, host, hold important stores of carbon and many other benefits for people. There are uh, a number of well understood ways to both restore and enhance those ecosystems to protect carbon. And then you get into the more um, uh, uh, geologic uh, based ways. So the oceans already um, sequester carbon by interacting with alkaline material from land and minerals. We can speed this process up. And in fact, you're going to hear in a moment from Project Vesta, who's working on exactly this, interacting alkaline material with seawater to sequester more carbon. And finally, we've heard a lot about direct air capture here in the last few minutes, but you can actually capture CO2 out of seawater. It exists at a much higher volume in seawater than it does in air, but essentially it's the same process of moving seawater through a, a membrane and a filter using electricity uh, to react with that to remove the carbon. So these are a series of domains about uh, carbon removal. My organization has created a series of roadmaps that um, go into detail on each one of these. This is what the website looks like. You can click on any one of these three uh, big technology domains and learn a lot more about the technologies. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example for macroalgae. State of technology will give you an overview. Bubble is on development gaps and needs. And finally, first order priorities, which will tell you what needs to work be worked on to move these forward. We're actively recruiting partners and collaborators. With that, I will yield back the time. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. All right, next up, we will have Zach from Southern Beam Builds. Zach, go ahead and take it away. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zach Coffin. Uh, most of you or many of you probably know me from my very large sculpture installations, such as the Temple of Gravity here. Um, as well as being an artist, I, um, I'm a fellow at the Black Rock Labs, and um, I've been a crane operator and heavy equipment operator at Burning Man for about 15 years. And before COVID, this would have been my 25th consecutive Burning Man before that got waylaid. Um, a couple of years ago, when COVID started, I was working with Ryan Mortana with BlackRock Labs, and we started looking at the problem with generators. Now, as been mentioned before with, with Marty, the, um, the most of the CO2 is at, from Burning Man is generated from transportation, but we still use about 20 megawatts of generator power. And one of the problems with generators, uh, not only they're loud and they're smelly, and they, they use a lot of uh, dirty fuel, but every gallon that we put into a generator takes several gallons to get it out of the ground to uh, refine it and then transport it to us. So we look at generators as a really critical um, way to change the way Burning Man is, is run. Um, so step one, if you're in a hole, you should stop digging. So we should start with the event and we should get rid of the generators first, as, first and foremost. But they, what we need to do, and I think this is how the whole world should look at it, is we need to figure out how to 
change our fuel source, but not ask everyone to just use less. I don't think that strategy works very well. We need to keep the power to party. So Ryan and I started working on a design utilizing the, the resources of the city and the, and the technologies here in the city. And the big one is containers. Burning Man several years ago started moving large amounts of containers to the desert um, to support all the infrastructure. Um, last count was about a thousand 20 foot containers that goes onto the playa and then gets removed and it has everything the city has. So we are working on a technology that will use, use this technology or use, use, this, con, use the container. So this is Dragon Wing, the design we've been working on for a couple of years now. It's the first mobile and retracting daily redeployable solar battery system in the 20 to, 20 to 50 kilowatt generator class. Now this unit is just the top unit. It will stack on any 20 foot container. This is sort of how it works. Let's see if this will, this will work. Okay, so we have the top container. We stick it up there with a forklift. And in the morning, it deploys automatically, absorbs sun. If there's a major storm or a major wind event, it will retract and self-protect. At the end of the day, it'll suck back in and it'll be ready for the morning. So that's the basic idea of the dragon wings. Let's see if I can do this here. All right, so some quick technical specs. Uh, every dragon wing unit can generate up to 23 kilowatts of power. This is real power. Um, we can store up to 450 kilowatts per dragon wing unit. This is the equivalent of six Tesla three batteries. So again, this is a lot of power. We can daisy chain them and we can make basically infinitely large microgrids. Um, we can, the unit is mobile and it can deploy in just a couple minutes. It's a push button deployment. So there's no labor involved in actually deploying it other than sending it onto the container and hitting go. Um, we have zero footprint in, in Black Rock City um, because we're going onto existing shipping containers and it'll give us high clearance shade, which is really gonna be very convenient. I, the, the hotter the sun, the better the system will work. As I said, we'll auto close in high winds and at night. Now we think that about 700 Jagged Wings will replace all the large generators at Black Rock City. Now this is based on um, you know, Black Rock Labs work and a lot of other calculations. And it's, um, it's a little bit of a guess. We think a thousand of these units would place all the generators and that would include all the little Hondas and the Kabutas and so on. But this is, again, is a major guess because we don't really know how many generators are out there, but there's a lot of them. Um, so here's the, here's the issue. If you have a thousand of these units, they won't be cheap and they're gonna be out there in the middle of nowhere in the desert. So what do we do with them for the 50 weeks that we're not um, generating power for our party. Well, this is where um, BlackRock Labs and air capture come in. We can use these systems, put them on top of an air capture unit like Matt Atwood presented and use them to either sequester carbon or create clean fuel. Um, and so, you know, like I mentioned in the very beginning, gallon for gallon, clean fuel is the lowest hanging fruit. So, um, in, and we're not going to replace the engines and art cars and a lot of that stuff for several years. So if we can power them with clean fuel, it's a, it's a multiple, a multiple of savings uh, in terms of carbon. Um, and just finally, uh, my experience with Burning Man is that there's some of the sharpest, most energetic people on the planet. And if we can do it at Burning Man, if we can show the world how to go first carbon neutral and then carbon negative, the whole world is looking at us and they will follow us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Zach. Good to see you. Next up, we will have Kelly. Kelly, take it away. Hello. Great to be here. So I'm Kelly Earhart. Um, I'm here today representing a team of scientists, entrepreneurs, and collaborators from around the world that are working on what we call coastal carbon capture. We're on a mission to harness the power of the oceans to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, as Brad and Amanda both alluded to. Um, I was also grateful to participate as a laggy technical advisor last year and have been making the Playa pilgrimage myself for the last uh, seven years. So really, really lovely to be here with, with all of you. <clears throat> the climate crisis has uh, kind of already been set in context in this meeting, so I'm not going to spend time talking about it. We're talking about this as a crisis, and it is. 
um, we've covered really well that emissions reductions are no longer enough and that today, in order to get out of disastrous climate scenarios, we need carbon dioxide removal. So we're going to learn about this sand, which happens to be my very favorite mineral. And no, it's not playa sand, though it does make for a harsh contender. Um, this mineral is called olivine. And before I dive into how we work with olivine at Project Vesta, I'm gonna take a moment to step back into the carbon cycle context. So Mira gave us a great introduction into the importance of the integrity of carbon markets. And what most of us think of when we think about carbon offsets typically, though of course we're at a Burning Man meeting, so not much is typical, uh, is planting trees, right? So trees grow, they absorb carbon dioxide, they die, they release carbon dioxide. This is all within the short-term carbon cycle. And when we're talking about long-term climate impact, permanence, or how long the carbon that we remove and sell stays removed from the atmosphere is, is really critical. So I love trees. Um, there's probably a billion reasons to plant a tree, but carbon removal and credit sales are maybe some of the last ones, especially in comparison to all of their valuable ecosystem services. We just can't afford for removed carbon to go up in smoke and forest fires, be cut down, or be respired more quickly by microbes in a warming world. Um, plus, I'll underscore that you know, with fossil fuels, what we've done is taken carbon that was stored long term in the in the lithosphere in rocks for millions or hundreds of millions of years, and put this into the atmosphere in just over a century. So. Can we really expect the short-term carbon cycle to wholly counterbalance the long-term carbon cycle interruptions that we've made? We don't think so. Which is why it's awesome that most of the solutions today are for focusing on forms of permanent carbon dioxide removal that removes and stores carbon geologically. The long-term carbon cycle has been working on planet Earth for billions of years, and it involves atmospheric carbon dioxide turning into rocks over very long time scales through natural chemical reactions with minerals. And up to 18 gigatons of carbon dioxide removal is going to be needed annually to avoid these disastrous climate scenarios that we've all been talking about today. So innovative approaches like we've heard about are absolutely necessary to be activating all at once. And my team and I at Project Vesta have a solution that could work at planetary scale, at gigaton scale, by harnessing the power of the oceans. So Brad mentioned, uh, you know, the oceans are, they play an incredibly large role in storing atmospheric carbon. They've been naturally removing carbon dioxide for billions of years and storing it safely. So if we can give the oceans a helping hand, we can speed that process up and begin to address the problem. Because it turns out that trillion extra tons of carbon dioxide that are floating in the atmosphere isn't just warming the planet, it's made our oceans more acidic and quite fast. So for anyone who's spent time in our oceans, you've probably even seen bleaching corals, fish populations dwindling, changes in the seashores that you live by. Ocean acidification is bringing marine ecosystems to the brink of collapse um, and billions of people around the world are relying on fish and our marine ecosystems for key sources of protein and, and livelihoods. And that's at risk today. So there is a link between carbon dioxide and ocean acidification. And there's a way that we can partner with nature to neutralize the extra acidity in the oceans, which can help them naturally remove carbon dioxide like they've been doing for billions of years. So at Project Vesta, we noticed there was decades of respected scientific research pointing to a promising solution, but no one was yet trying to bring that together into the real world to, to make it happen. And it turns out the solution is all you need to do is bring sand to the beach. Of course, there's more to it than that, but to summarize what we're doing is we're grinding up olivine, which is an abundant natural volcanic mineral, and creating something that we call carbon removing sand. We take this sand to the ocean, where it will gradually dissolve with the help of wave action and tides. As it dissolves, it helps make the ocean less acidic, which removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere permanently for millions of years, all by increasing the ocean's ability to safely store carbon dioxide. As an added benefit, 
Our process can also help create resilience for vulnerable coastal communities that are on the front lines of climate change today, experiencing sea level rise and erosion. By replacing typical sand that's used for coastal replenishment projects with olivine sand, we can provide a solution for coastal protection and beach nourishment projects to be carbon negative and climate resilient, kind of treating both the root cause and the symptoms of climate change in one go. So all in all, we call this solution coastal carbon capture. And you'll remember that I mentioned the long-term carbon cycle. That's our inspiration. We are working to accelerate one important part of the long-term carbon cycle by harnessing the power of the oceans to speed that cycle up to a human relevant timescale. We're rigorously monitoring ecological safety every step of the way, as well as working to ensure community engagement and local ownership. Our process helps make the ocean more alkaline, and we hope that means less coral bleaching, healthier fish, and coastal resilience. Coastal carbon capture is highly efficient. It's 97% efficient, meaning that for every 100 tons of carbon dioxide that we sequester, we can emit only three tons in our process. And that's because we're using the free energy of waves to do most of the work for us. For every ton of olivine sand that we add to the ocean, we can sequester one ton of carbon dioxide. And it's future-proofed. So as climate change worsens, as temperatures get warmer, as ocean acidity rises, as wave energy and storm surges increase, our process actually works better. It accelerates the, the dissolution of olivine rocks. Um, and lastly, we're not competing with land or fresh water that's used for agriculture and social livelihoods either. Now, there's much scientific research ahead of us before we can consider doing this at large scale because we're the first in the world to do this. Um, I'm really proud to be collaborating with these folks every day. And our team has grown since this photo with a couple extra brilliant PhD scientists that are on board to bring this solution out into the world. And, you know, our team is very deeply committed to this because it really could help change the course of our planet's future. There's enough olivine in the world that we could return to pre-industrial carbon dioxide levels. And of course, it will take more than one solution to solve climate change. But each dot that you see here is a place where large deposits of olivine are found. It doesn't take new technology. We can actually work with the efficiencies of the massive harmful industries that we've built, the shipping and mining, mining industries to bring this solution to scale. And it's a big lift, but industries of this scale have been built before. So right now we are running lab experiments. We're studying natural analog beaches and we're planning the very first field trials of coastal carbon capture around the world and here in the United States. If these succeed, this has the potential to be a billion ton per year solution. We have a measured initial rollout to ensure scientific rigor and ample time for research. But once our science is validated, there's a very clear path to global scale. By 2030, we're aiming to deliver permanent carbon removal at a cost of only $30 a ton. And I'll say that I'm dedicated to coastal carbon capture for a reason. Our time period, our window of opportunity is so short to enact the change that we need. And we need to invest in solutions that can truly scale. At Project Vesta, our mission is to harness the power of the oceans to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and help leave a planet in which we all can thrive. And before I close, let's just reflect. I mentioned at the beginning, this is the climate crisis, right? And if you think that the climate crisis is really a crisis, are you acting like it's a crisis or are these the words that you're using? What I've described today is not the entire solution. It's just one part of an incredibly complex problem. This effort requires change, imagination, and the courage to do the right thing. I love the action that Burning Man is taking here. The opportunity to be remembered kindly by future generations is here with us now. And in the spirit of participation from our 10 principles, I urge you to take a moment to reflect on what it would look like for you. What is it that's yours to hold to help resolve one of the greatest issues of our time? Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kelly. Good to see you. <clears throat> and finally, to wrap us up, we'll have Will Roger, one of the 
cultural co-founders of Burning Man Project. Will, take it away. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Uh, thank you, Matt. That was uh, an inspiring presentation. And thank you to all the remarkable people who contributed. 300 years of industrialization has pushed humans to the brink of disastrous habitat cha change on this planet Earth, our home, our mother. We need to be bold, creative, and innovative toward solving the problems that we have created. What was presented today gives us some hope that we can correct our course towards a new future for humanity on this earth, our home. Thank you all for participating. Our future is in our immediate actions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Will. Thanks to everyone who joined today. This will be a multi-year project and you are a stakeholder in this now. So we really appreciate everyone who came today and um, we'll be following up with emails, with links to these presentations and the slides and hope that you'll follow along with what we're doing in the future. You can write to our team at sustainability at burningman.org. Lots of appreciation to everyone who made this call happen. Thanks so much, everyone.